Tomorrow we go to this place. When we go to Banyas, to Mount Hermon, Har Hermon, you'll come to a cliff. And the facade of the cliff on the southwestern exposure of Mount Hermon, you'll find alcoves where there were statuettes of pagan gods and goddesses, nymphs for the god Pan, the god Pan. Pan in Greek mythology was a god who pretended to be a man. He was a god who pretended to be a man. And you'll see the alcoves with the statuettes. Okay. There'll be a cave next to it, and the actual location of the cave has shifted due to seismic activity. Out of the cave, you'll find a cascade going down into a series of brooks. Washing out with the cascade, you'll find all over on the banks of the brooks and all over the ground, millions and millions and millions of small chips of stone that are flat roughly the size of your thumbnail. Okay. This is Mount Hermon, and this water cascade we go tomorrow is called Banyas. Mount Hermon is snow capped about seven and a half or eight months of the year. The snow caps melt, the water goes down through the water table and comes out the cave into the cascade. That becomes one of the three primary sources of the Jordan, the upper Jordan, feeding into what in Jesus' day would have been known as the Hulda Lake, Lake Hulda. Today it's the Hulda Basin. It's all been drained. We drove through it today. One of the three sources of the Jordan is these series of brooks. Okay? Then it goes from the upper Jordan into the Sea of Galilee. This mountain was important. In the Apocrypha, we read in the book of Enoch that in the days of Jared, J-A-R-E-D, in the days of Jared, Yared in Hebrew, in the days of Jared, something happened here. The Nephilim came down in human form, procreating with human women. This idea that they were descendants of Noah or something like this is wrong. These were demonic beings in the Jewish understanding. The idea that they were something other than demonic beings is an invention of the church and about the fourth century. They came down here where this abomination took place that provoked the flood, the judgment in the days of Noah, which the epistle of Jude tells us about and which Jesus said will be just like the days of Noah. There will be somehow demonic incarnations or enfleshments in the last days. Separate subject, we have a tape talking about it just as in the days of Noah. We look at the phenomena of biogenetic engineering and how science and the occult are merging, particularly in particle physics, computer video graphics, and increasingly in microbiology, uh, genetic biology, molecular, bi molecular biology. In any event, in the days of Jared, that's where this happened. Later on in the Seleucid period, the Greeks built this temple to Pan, and the Greeks had a similar idea of human beings having sexual intercourse with supernatural beings. <laughs> Only they did this by surrogate method. They had hieros gamos, hieros gamos, temple prostitutes. Big deal in the Greek Empire. Incorporated into Roman civilization with things like the Vestal Virgins which were then Christianized with convents and so on, but the origin was temple prostitution. So what happened here in the apocryphal literature continued in some surrogate form on the Pan worship. Okay? Pan was a god who 
pretended to be a man in Greek mythology. In the days of Jesus, something else had been there when he was born. To impress and appease the Romans, the Herodians had built a temple to the emperor on top of the cliff. Specifically, it was the temple to Caesar Augustus. While Pan was a god pretending to be a man, Caesar Augustus was a man pretending to be a god. He, of course, was known as Octavius, famous for the Battle of Actium, involved with Cleopatra and Mark Anthony, and then they turned against him and all this. And he was later deified by the Roman Senate. Other Roman emperors were deified posthumously, but as we looked at in Caesarea, he was deified during his lifetime. So a man who was worshipped as God. The kissing of his ring, of his feet, etc., the emperor worship. As head of the pantheon of pagan Rome, his title became Pontificus Maximus. Or they called him for short the Pontiff. I would have called him Max. So you have a place here with a god pretending to be a man, mythologically, and a man pretending to be God. Caesar Augustus is the emperor when Jesus is born, and when Jesus is born, you have emperor worship. Caesar Augustus was the one who tried to number everybody, count everyone's head, to gain economic control of the known world, as we talked about in Quesadilla. What happens in his first coming prefigures what happens in his second coming with the mark of the beast, the numbering of people's heads. Then it was not actually an imprint on the head, but it was the idea of counting the people's heads, the capita. Okay. What happens in Matthew 16 is Jesus challenges the gods of this world on their own turf. The Jews of his day were obsessed by two things, by one thing. Roman dominion, but there were two emblems of it that obsessed them. In Jerusalem, as we will see, it was the fortress Antonio, temp uh, towering over the Temple Mount, symbolizing the dominion of imperial pagan Rome over their religion, their covenant with God. On Palm Sunday, they wanted Jesus to make a right and get rid of the Romans. Instead, he made a left and got rid of Benny Hinn, Morris Cirillo, and Kenneth Copeland. He kicked out the corrupt clergy who were profiteering on the blood of the Lamb. Judgment begins in the house with God, house of God. He's more concerned with the sin among his own people than he is with the sin of the world. The Jews, again, were expecting a political messiah who would get rid of the Romans as the Maccabees did the Greeks. But the emblem of it in Galilee that obsessed them was this, the temple of Caesar Augustus, hence Caesarea. Caesarea. Caesarea Philippe, okay, Philip the Tetrarch. Later it was changed to honor Nero called Neronius. The early Christians also thought Nero was the Antichrist. The first one where they counted 666 to somebody's name was Nero. And the early Christians thought he'd be reincarnated based on the book of Revelation. I can't spell as you can tell. Caesar Augustus, the loggy. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was the name of a salad. <laughs> I can speak a few languages, but I can't spell any of them. It's a true fact.
that's the background of what Jesus walks into. They're looking for somebody who is going to depose Greco-Roman religion and imperial rule. This was the messianic expectation. Let's look, however, at Matthew chapter 16. Verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippe, he began asking his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? In the Greek text, this borders on speculative flattery. And they said, some say John the Baptist, Yohanan Amatbil, others Eliyahu, Elijah, others Yeremiahu, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But he said to them, who do you say I am? The Greek here is plural, and it is emphatic. He's not just asking Peter, he's asking all of them. And Simon Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, or the Messiah. Okay. And he said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Shimon Bar-Yonah. Now, son, bar, is Aramaic for the Hebrew ben, son. It does not only mean that his father's name was or may have been Jonah, it means he's in the character of Jonah. In biblical times, Jews would name people after heroes in the, in, in the more ancient history of Israel in the hope that they would emulate the virtue of those heroes or prophets. Today, Jews will normally name a baby after, the, after a dead relative, so his name would not be blotted out. It's a, it's a tradition. But in biblical times, it was the, with the hope you would emulate the character of somebody. Hence, son of means in the character of. And as we speak of on the Jonah tapes, Jonah begins arguing with God, so right after this, Peter begins arguing with God. He's in the character of him. That's why Jesus emphasizes, you're a son of Jonah. Jesus knows that he begins behaving like Jonah. He emphasizes his surname because the surname indicates what he is. Now we explain this in greater depth on the Jonah tape. Pay attention, folks. You don't get this, most of this, in commentaries. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one he was the Messiah. Now, this is sandwiched in between two caveats. In chapter 16, verse 6, he's warning, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, the false doctrine. False doctrine is in the character of leaven. It puffs up and it's sin. But he finishes with a polemic against the religious establishment in verse 21. From that time, Jesus Christ began to show his disciples he must go to Jerusalem to suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, scribes, and be killed and be raised up the third day. If you don't know, Jesus Christ and Christ Jesus are different. Same person, but different. When it puts the messianic title first, Christos Jesus, Christ Jesus, it's him in eternity. It's him in heaven, it's him in an exalted state. When it's Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, instead of HaMashiach Yeshua, when it's Jesus Christ, Jesus Christos, it is him on earth. Okay? It's sandwiched in between two warnings about the religious establishment. So in other words, the apostles standing down here where we will be standing tomorrow are concerned about this. Jesus is saying, don't worry about them. Worry about your own religious leaders. Otherwise, this wouldn't be here. How did it get there? Well, the Herodians built it. How did the tribe of Pan get there? Well, under the Seleucids, Jews collaborated with Antiochus, with the Hellenization of their culture and the influx of pagan influence into their religion. Had their own religious leaders not misled them, the, tri the 
the uh, Temple of Pan ever would have been built. Had they not invited Pompey in and, and had the, the house of Herod never would have been established, and the temple to the emperor, the pontiff, never would have been built. Okay? So he's warning about their own leaders. They're only obsessed with what Jesus was indicating was the result of the actions of their leaders. Okay. Let's continue. So Jesus gives the keys. The question is, does he give the keys to Peter and establish the primacy of Peter? Or does he give the keys to the apostles corporately? Additionally, what does this binding and loosing mean, and what are these keys? You'll know that this is on the slope of the mountain, yeah? Tomorrow. Mount Hermon. The Roman Church claims it's the pontiff, the pope. When Constantine relocates the imperial capital to, to Constantinople, Istanbul, he bequeaths the imperial properties to the bishop in Rome, and after that, the bishops in Rome begin claiming some primacy. Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, the Roman Catholic bishop in America, a famous one, said in our lifetime, there is no definite record of claim to the authority of Peter until the fourth century. The Roman Catholic Church was institutionally established largely by Constantine the Great and what came after him. Its theology was largely established by Augustine of Hippo and those who influenced him, particularly Cyprian of Carthage and his mentor, Ambrose of Milan. The papacy was established by Gregory I, and then it evolved from there. Roman Catholicism didn't actually become what it is today until the Council of Trent in the aftermath of the Reformation in its present state. Now the Roman Church claims the keys were given to Peter. Even if the keys were given to Peter, where was Peter given the authority to pass them on to somebody else, even though there's no record of that ever happening in Eusebius or any of the early Christian history? But were the keys given to Peter? What are these keys? Is it the keys of Hades that means who goes to heaven and hell? We're told in John chapter 9, all judgment of that nature is given to Jesus, not to Peter. Turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. Verse 7, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, and who shuts, no one opens. Notice the Davidic motif of Jesus as Messiah King. The Davidic motif. Jesus has that key, so it can't be that key. He's the one who opens, no man closes, closes, no man opens. It can't be that key even though popes have forced nations to go to war, saying they will use that key to put an anathema on those nations who didn't do what they said. Let's look at a few examples. Why in South America, the only country in South America that they speak Portuguese is Brazil, and the rest mainly Spanish. The pope decreed it. He had the keys. He claimed the inheritance of Constantine, that Peter gave the keys, gave the dominion of the world to Constantine the Great, and Constantine gave it to the Pope. Uh, Peter gave it to Constantine. Constantine bequeathed it to the Pope. So the world belongs to the Pope. He can do what he wants with it. If you don't agree, you won't go to heaven. He'll put a papal anathema on you. Let's look at Holy Catholic Ireland. The Celtic Church in Great Britain continued to resist the, on, the, the influence of the Roman papacy until the Council of Whitby. 
When Augustine came, not Augustine of Hippo, but Augustine of Canterbury, they rejected him. The original British church rejected this, caved in at the Council of Whitby, but the Irish continued to resist until the 8th century. King Henry the, I'm sorry, Pope Adrian IV threatened to communicate Henry II. Henry II was not even an Anglo-Saxon. He was a Norman. If you do not invade Ireland and put an end to the Celtic Church and force them to, com to come under the Roman Church, I'll excommunicate you. I have the keys. How did Great Britain get involved in Ireland? The Pope sent them. Ireland is the... <laughs> It's the most outrageous thing you can imagine if you understand the historical development of it. The Pope sent the British. They didn't even want to go there. The Pope sent them. The only people who will know this will be Irish academics like Colin, uh, Colin Cruz, O'Brien, those people will know it. But the average Irish person wouldn't know this. Nor would the average Protestant person know this. They don't want to know it. He had the keys. He forced nations to go to war. So he said. Well, what key is it then, if it's not this key of David, if it's not the key of judgment? What key is it? Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 23. You tie heavy loads, in verse 4, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves are unwilling to move them so much as a finger. They think they can do what they want. As we looked at today in the synagogue of Cortazine, the cathedra. Only now, instead of the cathedra of Moses, it becomes the cathedra of Peter. They can do what they wanted. They said. What then are the keys and what is the binding and loosing? What keys did Jesus mean? Turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 11, verse 52. Woe to you lawyers, for you've taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering you hindered. <laughs> the poor people were called Ha'am Ha'aretz people of the land. The Levites were to teach the people, but by Jesus' day, the Sanhedrin became a self-serving theocratic aristocracy. The Pharisees knew the Midrashim. They knew the words of the wise and their riddles. They knew the Mashal and the Nimshal. Remember Jesus interprets the parable of Isaiah? In Matthew 13, it says, the Pharisees know he knew he spoke the parable about them. They knew what it meant. But he had to go explain to his disciples privately. The ordinary people didn't know. Jesus was taking knowledge as power. Jesus was taking the understanding of the scriptures and giving it to ordinary people, which threatened them politically and financially. So the keys will be taken from you and given to others, the key of knowledge. In other words, it'll be taken from the Sanhedrin and given to the apostles. I'm going to take it from one group of Jews and give it to another. These keys have to do with binding and with loosing. Look with me, please, very briefly to Matthew 18. It's when you catch your brother in sin or your brother sins against you. You go to him privately. Then you go with witnesses, beginning in verse 15. But if he doesn't listen to the witnesses, you bring it before the body. In verse 18, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Same Greek words. So the first place, whatever binding and loosing means, you should look in the same gospel. It means the authority given to the church to deal with irrepentant sin in its ranks. 
One example of this is Paul's authority in 1 Corinthians 5 when the guy was involved in an incestuous relationship with his father's wife. Paul gave him over. Okay. Now that authority was not peculiar to Peter or even to the apostles. It's to all of us. So they're misappropriating something out of context. That's the first thing binding and loosing means. But the second thing is this. Turn to Acts 15. The issue here becomes circumcision of Gentiles. Do they have to keep the law? And the apostles, inspired by the Holy Spirit, after hearing from Paul and Barnabas, etc., say there are four things the Gentiles must do. These four commandments derive from the Noahide covenant, from what God told Noah. They derive from what God told Noah in Genesis. They had to keep away from idolatry, from fornication, from what was strangled, which had to do with cruelty to animals, but also idolatry, and from blood. Four things. Pay attention. Bind loose. In Greek, bind and loose. Loose, luo. Bind, deo. Not to be confused with the Latin word for God. Okay? These are simply the Greek translations of two terms known in Judaism to this day as asur and hitir. We talk today in its thought about halakha, codified religious Jewish law. In a Jewish religious court, you'd look for halakhic decisions issued by a scholarly rabbi who would be the judge, called a dayan, a dayan. You know the Israeli general Moshe Dayan? Remember the guy with the patch? He might have had an ancestor who was a dayan. From the Hebrew word din, meaning law. This court is called a bet din. And the rabbi there, the dayan, will tell you if something is a sore or hitir. If it's loosed, if you're, if you, you're free to do it, or if you're bound not to. Where does the Torah bind? For instance, of the 613 commandments, halakhically, a Jew is free to break every one of them to save his life or the life of another except three. He cannot commit murder. He cannot engage in, in, in incest or perverted sex, bestiality, homosexuality, things like that. Or he cannot engage in idolatry. But to save his or her life or the life of another person, they can break all of the other commandments except for idolatry, sexual immorality, and uh, murder. Okay. They are hitir, loosed from the requirements of the Torah. But murder, immorality, and idolatry remain a sore. The apostles were given the keys. The Gentiles were hitir, loosed. They don't have to keep the same Sabbath as the Jews or the same holidays. They don't have to have circumcision. They can eat leaven at Passover. They're free. Hitir, they're free from the law. But idolatry, strangulation of animals, cruelty to animals, Fornication, blood, is a sore. That's what it means. Acts 15 is the perfect example of the keys that were given by Jesus to the apostles. That's binding and loosing. Here on a sore. Okay. It has nothing to do with the idiotic nonsense propagated today by the March for Jesus. Nothing to do with the idiotic nonsense in books like Taking Our Cities for God by John Dawson championed by youth with the mission and groups like that. Nothing to do with this nonsense. Very briefly, look at Acts 17.
Verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was beholding the city filled with idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and God-fearing Gentiles in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present, and also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, etc. The Areopagus. Anybody here been to Athens? Some of you must have been, right? Perhaps next year we're looking at Paul's second missionary journey. Anyway, Athens is like this, the original Athens. Not Piraeus, but the original Athens. Down here is the area of Athens you've been to, if you've been to Athens, called Plaka, where you'll find the best preserved ruins of the Greek world. You'll find the pavilion of the market called the Agora, won't you? Up here you'll find a hill called Acropolis. Acro, and then Polis is city. On it, you'll find the ruins of the Parthenon, several minor temples, Temple of Athena, the Parthenon, several minor temples, and an amphitheater. In between the two is another hill called Mars Hill. Today, it's a cluster of boulders on which there was a platform in Paul's day. That was called the Areopagus where Paul debated the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. He's standing here. He looks up and he sees the idols, the demonic powers over the city. In Corinthians, he calls other gods demonoi, demons. So does Moses. He, Moses calls them Shadim, demons. Our Ray Krishna is a demon. He's not a god. Shiva and Rama, these are demons. So are the gods of Greece. Paul says it in Corinthians, Moses says it. He looks up. What does Paul do when he looks up and he sees the demonic powers over Athens? Again, today at Cortezine, we looked at the Greek word arche. I think my spelling in English is bad. Best translated. Not territorial spirit, but principality. What does Paul do in light of the demonic principality, the powers of the air, as he calls them in Ephesians? We take authority over this spirit of Athena worship in the name of Jesus. We bind this spirit. Does he do a John Dawson? Does he do a, does he do a, a, a Grand Kendrick Kim? What does he do? Or does he preach the gospel? To the Areopagus, the Areopagites, doesn't he? The Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Then he goes to the Agora, and he witnesses in the marketplace. Then he goes to the synagogue and preaches to his fellow Jews. Why? What, is the weapons, what are the weapons in Ephesians? Put on the armor of God, pick up the sword. The scripture. This stupid, idiotic, moronic garbage. The march for Jesus is found by dominionists. People with an unbiblical eschatology called Kingdom Now, Dominionism. It's absolute idiocy. No biblical foundation. But their ideas of spiritual warfare are decrepitly stupid. The choruses they sing are not even biblical. You know about Graham Kendrick? Put a match to his songbook. The lyrics are on script. Now is the time for us to march on the land. We're building a kingdom. That is garbage. Daniel 7.22 when the Ancient of Days comes, the saints take possession of the kingdom. It's over-realized eschatology, dominionism. It is not biblical. Instead of concentrating on evangelism, they're concentrating on speaking into the heavenlies and binding and loosing. Why? Because this is a theology of morons, which is no theology at all. We bind this spirit, we take it. The binding and loosing has to do with two things. Only two, dealing with irrepentant sin in the fellowship, and the other is the apostolic authority to define doctrine. Hear what I said? Dealing with irrepentant immorality in the fellowship and the apostolic authority to define doctrine. John Dawson doesn't know what he's talking about. Roger Foster doesn't know what he's talking about. None of them know what they're talking about because they don't read the Bible. They write their own. 
It is all nonsense. All of it. Now, by the way, I myself believe in the gifts of the Spirit. By both experience and theology, I'm a moderate Pentecostal, if you want to use the word. I say that for the video because I'll try to say he's a cessationist. He's not open to the things of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I'm open to the things of the Holy Ghost, but I'm not open to the, non to the spirit that they're into. Going back now to Matthew 16. Upon this rock, in the Middle Ages, people had the Vulgate that only the clergy could read, and some of them were mendicants. They couldn't read it. Oh, Peter's the rock. When the reformers, influenced by humanist scholarship, go back to read the original Greek manuscripts, they realize that's not what it means. Rock. Petra. Petros, Greek. Hebrew, and then of course they use also the Aramaic word. Petros is masculine singular. In Greek, in Hebrew, and this is feminine, singular, in Greek. Okay. The word in Hebrew for Petros is Eben. You know the word Ebenezer? Eben Ezra, rock of my strength. Eben. Meaning rock, as in boulder. Petros is Selah in Hebrew. It's the name Selah. Selah. It means chip or pebble. Sorry, sorry, got these wrong. <laughs> Petra is Sela Evan. That's the Greek. Yeah. So they're the wrong way around. Uh, Petros is masculine and Sela is feminine. And, and Petra is feminine. Petra is, yeah, feminine. Thank you. It's the senility. <laughs> okay. You are one of these chips. But upon the boulder, I'll build my church. The pre-Nicene fathers were of two opinions. A few of them, a minority of the patristic writers, said the rock was the faith of Peter. Only a few. The majority said the rock was Christ. None of them ever said the rock was Peter. The text and the context does not allow it. Turn with me, please to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 3, verse 11. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. If you can't build a foundation that the church can have no other foundation but Christ, how can it be Peter? Was Paul lying? Or is the Roman church lying? No foundation other than Christ. Again, we look today at the baptism in 1 Corinthians 10, 
The rock that followed them was Christ. The water coming out of the rock, right? Was the rock Jesus, always. He's always the Petra, the Sela, not the Petros, not the little chip. Okay? David had little stones. That was the ox of his help. So what Jesus came to do, he says, listen, the gates of Hades, upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Gates have to do with the place of authority in Hebraic thought. The gates of Hades was simply the Greek way of saying hashar'e sheol, shar'e sheol. It was a rabbinic metaphor for biological death. So what Jesus was saying is this. Listen, they built this temple to this guy, Caesar Augustus, he's pushing up daisies, he's dead. The gates of hell prevailed against him. Death overcame him. Immediately after this, immediately after, Jesus begins speaking of his own resurrection in verse 21. Because of the resurrection, the gates of hell will not overcome him. The only thing the Roman Catholic Church does is replace one pontiff for another. Instead of the temple being built on Caesar, it becomes built on the pontiff, both called Pontificus Maximus. The very thing the apostles wanted to get rid of, the Roman church put back. And of all things, outrage of outrages, they used Peter's name to do it. I ask you a question. Can you possibly use a chip of stone? You'll see them all over the ground tomorrow. Can you possibly use the chip of stone as the foundation for a building? <laughs> no, you cannot use a Petros as a foundation. You have to use a Petra. It can't be, Peter. It makes no sense. The Aramaic word of this is Sifa, Kefa. But they, get, and they Latinized it to Cephas. Okay. What the Roman church will try to say is, yes, but Jesus was speaking Aramaic. And in Aramaic, well, you don't have that kind of distinction. It's the same word for rock and the same word for stone, Cephas. That is their argument. Look, the pre Nicene fathers knew that. They claimed to get their doctrine from the pre Nicene fathers. How come not one of them ever said that? Not one of them. Secondly, Look at the situation in its context. It would make no sense. No sense. You can't use a foundation stone, a pebble for a foundation. The whole thing is total nonsense. The early church never believed it. Why did the Roman Catholic Church put the Bible books, go back to Acts 15. Verse 13, after they stopped speaking, James answered, brethren, listen to me. Did James say, listen to Peter the Pope? First of all, if Peter was the Pope, why wasn't he presiding at the first church council? Why was James presiding? 
And why did he say listen to the Pope? If this was the magisterium of the church, why didn't he say listen to the Pope? He said listen to me. He said, goes on to say, therefore it is my judgment, it's Peter's judgment, verse 19 knows my judgment, that we do not trouble those who are turning from the Gentiles, but that we write to them. Notice we. He could not make the pronouncement unilaterally, unilaterally or autocratically. It had to be a corporate decision, didn't it? <laughs> the whole Roman system is a big bag of lies based on politics, money, and debauchery. But it's nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Nothing. Nothing. He's the pontiff. He's not the Peter. Now what Jesus was warning about is, don't worry about Caesar, he'll die of his own accord. Where is Caesar Augustus now? The gates of hell prevailed, pre <laughs> prevailed against him. He was pro prophesying, it was a word, that Christianity would displace the pagan religions of pagan Rome. We deal with this on the Who Do You Say I Am tape. Now let's go back to this. Look at chapter 17. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brought them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. And Peter answered and said to the Lord, Lord, is it good for us to be here? Now, the Roman church will always push the Peter issue. Always. First of all, how come no New Testament manuscript, no New Testament manuscript uses the Aramaic Kaifa? How come they always use Petros? How come they always make the distinction? Secondly, if Peter is the Pope, look in Galatians 2. How come... Paul rebukes him in the presence of all. When's the last time you saw an ordinary priest or bishop or cardinal in public telling the Pope where to get off in public? Not a single manuscript uses the Aramaic form. Every manuscript uses the Greek, designating the difference between Petros and Petra. So Peter answered and said, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were much afraid. And Jesus came to them, touched them, and said, Arise, do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus. Turn with me, please, to the book of Zechariah. We looked at Megiddo, at Zechariah 12. Let's see how this story of the return of Jesus ends in Zechariah 14. He comes back in chapter 12. They look upon him who they have pierced. In chapter 14, verse 16... It'll come about that any who are left of all the nations that went up to Jerusalem will go up year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and celebrate Hag Sukkot, the Feast of Booths. And it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And if the family of Egypt does not go up or enter, then no rain will fall on them. It will be the plague with which the Lord smites the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Then the third time, it mentions the Feast of Booths in verse 19. The messianic fulfillment of the Feast of Booths was only partial in John 7. Ultimately, it's the millennial reign of Jesus. We explain the whole typology of this in the Autumn Feast of Israel tape. The reason Peter wanted to build three booths is he thought it was the beginning of the millennium. Here's the Messiah, here's the resurrection, here's Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, here's Eliyahu, Elijah. It's the millennium. He wanted to build three booths. 
Palm Sunday, instead of celebrating Passover, they pick up lulavim, palm branches, the way you do at the Feast of Booths, and begin celebrating the Feast of Booths. They thought it was the millennium. We deal with this on the Palm Sunday tape. Peter's behavior was totally rational. There was this New Ager, called himself a Christian in England, called Patrick Dixon, but he's a New Ager. He says that altered states of consciousness are manifestations of the Holy Spirit. You know the Hindu altered states of consciousness? And he said, look at Peter's irrational behavior. At the Transfiguration, there was nothing irrational about it. I confronted him with this at a meeting of the Evangelical Alliance with leaders, and he had no answer. Just another one who writes his own Bible. Patrick Dixon's a New Ager. Calls himself a Christian, but his philosophy, his theology is totally New Age. Peter wants to build the boots. He thinks it's the millennium. That's, again, Jesus' purpose in his second coming. This is the clearest picture we have of the resurrection and the rapture. Mount Hermon is the highest mountain in Israel. It is where Lebanon, Galilee, and Syria come together. Go there tomorrow. It's in the air, above Banyas. You have Jesus transfigured. You have Moses, a man who died faithful to God. Moses prayed to enter the promised land on Mount Nebo, Har Navob. Remember, he, but he couldn't enter? And God said, seek me no more about this. He could not enter until Jesus came, because the law couldn't save. You understand? Not until Jesus came could he enter the land. Okay? Rep Moses represents the law. So you have Moses, a man who died faithful to God. You have Jesus, and you have somebody who was raptured, Elijah. Turn with me, please, to 1 Thessalonians. In conclusion, before we eat. Verse 17 of chapter 4, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort each other with these words. Those who die in the Lord, represented by Moses. Those who are raptured, represented by Elijah. It doesn't matter if you're dead in Christ or alive in Christ when he comes. We meet the Lord in the air. We shall be as he is. You understand? They all look the same. And Peter knew that was Elijah. We're going to know that's Ruth. We're going to know that that's Esther. We're going to know that that's Isaiah. And they're going to know us. Because we'll know Jesus and they'll know Jesus. This is the clearest illustration, the clearest picture in the Bible we have of the rapture and resurrection. We meet the Lord in the air. It doesn't matter if you're dead in Christ when he comes. It doesn't matter if you're raptured when he comes. We meet him in the air. We shall be as he is. Thank you.